we welcome our eminent presenter, Mr. Sandeep Shivastva, who is Executive Director, Rolling Stock, NHSRCL. Is the Executive Director, Rolling Stock at National High Speed Rail Corporation Limited, had 11 years of experience, mainly in the field of maintenance of traction rolling stock in Indian Railway initially, then worked in the field of design of new electric locomotive of Indian Railways, with focus on propulsion system at RDSO. He is presently handling high speed rolling stock at NHSRCL, National High Speed Rail Corporation Limited, was corporated on 12 February 2016 under the Companies Act 2013 with an object to finance, construct, maintain, and manage the high speed rail corridor in India. The company has been modeled a special purpose vehicle in the joint sector with equity participation by central government through Ministry of Railways and two state governments with Government of Gujarat and Government of Maharashtra. Welcome to this presentation uh, of key design features of high speed train sets. I am from National High Speed Rail Corporation looking after the rolling stock uh, of the project Mumbai Ahmedabad. I will be talking about the key design features of high speed train sets. And when, when I say high speed train set, it means the trains which are capable of running at the speed more than 250 kmph. Since Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed rail project, the train will be running at a maximum operating speed of 320 kmph. So my presentation mainly covers the rolling stock which runs around 300 kmph. Although the high speed train is anything which runs beyond 250 kmph. The contents of my presentations are, uh, to start with, I will be talking about high speed train sets, the types of high speed train sets. And beginning from that, uh, there are two types of uh, train sets uh, if the traction power is considered, that is concentrated power and distributed power. Then we'll talk about articulated bogey and non-articulated bogies. Then single deck or double deck trains. The tilting trains are also there for achieving high speeds on curves. So we'll be talking about tilting or non-tilting trains. Then something about the pressure comfort uh, in the cars uh, for the passengers, that is sealing of the trains because the high speed trains are required to be airtight. Then the ride comfort, the next topic will be ride comfort, which is very important for high speed trains because a lot of vibrations happens when the train runs at high speed. The noise, uh, they produce uh, noise at high speed uh, to the environment. So we'll be talking about that. And the very last, uh, we'll be talking about aerodynamic requirements because at high speed, the aerodynamic requirement of the train plays a very vital role. So all these features, design features, uh, I will be discussing along with the, the prevalent standards followed word over and their values and what we are following in the Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed rail projects for the Shinkansen trains. So as far as the types of the high speed trains are concerned, architecture wise, uh, from the traction point of view, there are two types of uh, traction system. One is distributed traction, other is concentrated traction. Uh, we will subsequently uh, discuss this uh, distributed and concentrated traction in detail in the next uh, slides. From the bogey point, Point of view, there are two types of bogies. One is non-articulated and other is articulated. Non-articulated bogies are the conventional bogies where each car is rested on two set of bogies. And in articulated bogies, the two cars are rested on one bogie. That means in between two cars, uh, there is one bogies. There is one bogie which is shared by two cars as you can see in the figures. Then there is an articulated single axle bogey also, uh, where the bogey has got only one pair of wheels in between two cars. So the distributed traction is prevalent in the countries like Japan, China, Germany, and Italy, where the traction is distributed in most of the trains. Whereas in France, Korea, and Spain, uh, there is a concentrated power. That means there is a loco at the top of the train and at the tail of the train. 
and they work in pushpull mode this single uh, axle or single pair of wheel with articulated bogies in spain is called talgo trains which is also known as natural tilting trains we will discuss all these uh, in detail in the uh, subsequent slides so first is the types of type of traction so as we have seen in the last slide there is a distributed power and there is a concentrated power in distributed power the power is is distributed all along the length of the train that means there are motor cars to the extent of 60 to 80 percent of the number of cars suppose if there are 10 cars in a train the, the motorization can be to six cars to eight cars and these motors are smaller in size smaller in power and distributed all along the trains whereas in concentrated power the traction motors are concentrated only in the two locomotives which are provided at the top at the tail of the train and the size of the motors are more because for running at a particular speed you need the same power for a concentrated power train also so the size of the motor becomes higher because the numbers are lower so this is a difference between a distributed power and concentrated power distributed power is also known as uh, emu trains that is electric multiple units the bottom graph shows uh, the seating capacity of these trains as you can see the di distributed single deck uh, train will have uh, around 20 percent more seating capacity as compared to the concentrated single deck trains now we'll compare uh, these two types of uh, uh, distributed sy uh, traction systems so this is a table where the attribute of both the systems are shown for example the propulsion system and the distributed power it is lower power there are large number of uh, propulsion system large number of traction motors whereas in the concentrated power the number of traction motors and propulsion is small but it's, it has got higher power regarding adhesion because in distributed power the power of a traction motor individual traction motor is smaller uh, the driving the wheel the traction motor is smaller so you get a better addition where in case of concentrated power the issue of addition happens because the power of traction motor is more axle load obviously since uh, size of the traction motor is low uh, the axle load is low in case of distributed power and high in the concentrated power the passenger capacity for distributed power is is full to the capacity that means all the cars are available for the passenger capacity whereas in concentrated power since two uh, the top and the, the tail cars are, are locomotives so you lose two car for the seating the advantages of the concentrated power is that since the traction motors are not provided in the passenger cars so the noise to the passengers are lesser whereas in distributed power it is slightly higher since the number of traction motors and propulsion are larger in distributed power the maintenance related issues are more in large in, in distributed power whereas in concentrated power it is small whereas uh, because of the more number of propulsion system the redundancy in the, of the main component uh, is more in distributed power that means in case of failure of one traction motor or one propulsion system there is always availability of other propulsion system because their numbers are more and they are distributed all along the train whereas in concentrated power there are only two locomotives if something happens then you lose more power that means redundancy is less as far as restriction to the maximum speed uh, there is no issues in both the uh, traction system um, i mean the train can run to a maximum speed of 300 kmph for both the system but the important is that the advantages of concentrated power is regarding noise and maintenance uh, is not that uh, that dominant as such because noise in the passenger cabin you can you can overcome by providing better insulation in the floor area and 
with the recent advancement in technology, the maintenance cost of EMUs also have gone down. The equipments have improved. So maintenance cost wise also, uh, there's the, the difference between distributed power and concentrated power is not that much. And the main advantage of distributed power is a lighter axle load. We'll discuss in the next slide how the lighter axle load or low weight of the train actually benefits the high speed running. So keeping all these points in view, uh, the recent trend uh, has been uh, for the distributed power word over. In fact, uh, the France which, used, which uses uh, basically the concentrated power later on also developed distributed power trains. The Korea which adopted French technology for their KTX trains have recently gone for uh, distributed powers and other countries are already there in the distributed powers. Recent trend is for the high speed train is to adopt distributed power. And in Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed rail project, since we are adopting Japanese uh, Shinkansen technology, we will be going for distributed power. So what is the advantage of, uh, of the train having a lighter axle load? Lighter axle load results in energy efficient high speed trains. Why? Because design of energy efficient rolling stock is, is very important uh, for sustainability over the design life. And low axle load means low power and the low power per seat uh, is basically the indication of the energy efficient design of high speed trains. We'll see how the various rolling stock, high speed rolling stocks uh, uh, feature in this area. This is a comparative table of various countries uh, of high speed trains and you can see that the Japan, France, Italy, all the countries have been listed here and the type of rolling stock which are prevalent there uh, are there. And as you see, the maximum axle load of the, of the rolling stock, if you see the Japanese rolling stock has got the minimum axle load uh, that is around 13.1, whereas the French, which is a loco, and uh, Spain, which is a loco, is around 17 ton. Taiwan, it is 14 ton, is again EMU. China is 13.8 in again EMU. Germany is less than or equal to 16 ton, again EMU. Italy, which is an EMU, but the axle load is 17 ton. It is because of articulated bogies. We will discuss this in, in this subsequent slide, articulated bogies. And if you see the power per seat, the Japanese train uh, have got a wider car body so and, and a lower axle load. That means they can accommodate more number of passengers in that train because of the wider car body, which is around 3,350 uh, millimeter, whereas in Europe, it is something around 3,000 uh, millimeter. So they have got one extra seat, one extra seat uh, in every row. So coupled with lower axle load, uh, which requires lesser power, you can see uh, the power per seat is the lowest uh, uh, in the Japan. Obviously, obviously Taiwan is, is on the Shinkansen technology. It is the lowest in the world because of higher number of seats. Uh, power wise, they are same as Shinkansen. Whereas uh, in European, if you see the French, the, the power per seat is quite high, 23. And whereas in Italy, it is 16, Germany is around 18, Spain is around 22. So the power per seat, uh, because of their low axle load and uh, the higher seat seating capacity, uh, the, uh, the kilowatt per seat is, is lowest in case of uh, Japanese technology, or you can say that in case of EMU technology also, or the distributed power also, the power per seat is, is lesser as compared to the concentrated power. Then the lower axle load also leads to the HSR efficiency. Uh, what is HSR efficiency? HSR efficiency is normally used to indicate actual energy efficiency in operation of the high speed rolling stock. And it is uh, indicated in terms of kilowatt hour per seat kilometer. That means what energy you require to transport it to one uh, a passenger for a one kilometer. If, if we see the, uh, the high speed trains worldwide, how do they fare in, in this HSR efficiency? You can see that the Shinkansen series has got the lower HSR efficiency. That is best one it is around 0 0.029 kilowatt hour per seat kilometer. And the maximum is Eurostar which is 0 0.041 kilowatt hour per seat kilometer. Although the HSR efficiency varies uh, as per the HSR lines, 
depending upon um, route distance, number of stops, rolling stocks, seating capacity, speed, and all those parameters. But still, uh, uh, the lower axle load, uh, because it requires lesser power, so energy also running, energy will be reduced. So the lower the axle load, the better the power requirement, the lower the power requirement, and, and the better the HSR efficiency. So, so in view of these, I mean, the distributed power, the EMU configuration of a high-speed train is preferable. Then we come to the bogey uh, architecture. There are two types of uh, bogies. One is uh, non-articulated and one is articulated. As you can see in this picture, the articulate trains have parts, and the bogies, uh, one bogie share uh, the load of two cars. Whereas in non-articulated bogies, each bogie has each car has got two bogies, as in conventional trains. So for a for a 200 meter uh, train, uh, a conventional train will have eight cars, and eight cars will have 16 bogies. Whereas in uh, articulated bogies, there will be only 11 cars, and for a 200 meter train, and there will be 12 bogies. So for the same length of the train the number of cars reduces in articulated bogies and the distance and the length of the car also reduces. So we'll see what are the advantages of articulated and non-articulated trains. As, as is very evident that uh, bogies are not under the passenger area, they are under the gangways. So the less noise goes to the passenger area. The vibrations are also less because the end of the car is very firmly tied up with the bogies and there are less lateral movements. Because of the less number of bogies, the weight of the train reduces, so the less energy is there, and less number of bogies will result in the less preventive maintenance. And since the end of the cars are firmly tied, so stability is, is better in, in, in the articulated bogies, there is a rigid joint at the end, so there is let, uh, reduce jack and knife effect and there is a less possibility of rollover and derailment in case of uh, articulated trains but the disadvantage and one of one advantage is that that since uh, the end end of the train is uh, is tied up it is not it does not have any overhang portion so the throw because of overhang portion is not there that means uh, the kinetic gauge of the train will be lower, so you require a lesser infrastructure gauge, so which reduces the cost of the infrastructure. The minus point of uh, articulated bogey is that it reduces the length of the car due to bogey base limitation, because between the two bogies, uh, you have limitations. So based on the, that limitation, the car length is it is limited to 13 meter to 18 meter as compared to 25 meter in the conventional trains so the number of passengers uh, is reduced because you lose passenger area and since the number of axles uh, reduces in uh, in articulated bogies the axle load becomes higher and the uh, the the coupling between the two cars, these, because the two cars share the same bogey, the uncoupling becomes uh, a bit difficult uh, in, in, uh, in articulated bogies and require a depot, a special depot infrastructure for uncoupling uh, the two cars. So there is a cost element comes into play. Then we uh, discuss the single deck or double deck. There are two types of high speed train. One is a single deck or the double decks. Uh, in France, when uh, they wanted to increase the uh, passenger capacity of the train, uh, there were two ways. One was to increase the length of the train. Then that means you have to increase the length of the platform, which was not possible. So what they did, they uh, devised this concept of double deck uh, train in the high speed uh, because their structure gauge permitted that, that they can have a double decking of the passengers. And since uh, the trains were of concentrated power moved by the locomotives, there were nothing on the underframe. So they could lower the underframe uh, I mean, between bogies and they can provide two level of passenger uh, areas. And the main doors will were 
were kept at the same level of the existing platforms. So by doing that, a double deck structure is possible in concentrated uh, power also and in distributed power also, but it is more advantageous in, in, in concentrated power where you can get around 35 to 40% increase in the passenger capacity. Whereas in, uh, in uh, distributed traction, because you have got uh, propulsion equipments uh, in the under frame, so uh, the increase is not that much high. It is only 15 to 25% increase in the passenger capacity. The negative part of the double deck train is that the structure gauge you require of the bigger size, the axle load becomes higher. And since the cross section of the high the train uh, becomes larger because of the increased height of the trains, uh, there is a higher uh, differential pressure when the train moves in, uh, in the tunnel at higher speed. And that uh, causes fatigue in the car body. And uh, that reduces the life of that train if they are moved at, at that speed in the tunnel so that is why uh, the, the double track train where that where uh, there is a tunnel and the speed is is restricted to around something around 265 260 kmph uh, and where in the in the corridor where there is no tunnels i mean you can move the high speed train at 300 kmph also there is no issues so, but because of this fatigue uh, in the um, uh, in the tunnels and the speed is restricted in the tunnel for the double deck train. Then the next uh, feature is the tilting uh, uh, tilting of the trains because uh, on the curves, uh, if, if you want to increase the speed, either you have to flatten the curve or you tilt the train on the opposite direction uh, of the curve, on the inside side of the curve so that you can increase the uh, speed of the train. So, uh, I mean, with the tilting train, you can achieve a speed of 250 kmph on the curves which are prevalent mainly uh, on the high speed sections. So these types, there are different types of tilting arrangements which are prevalent in the world. One is a pneumatic tilting, whereas the tilting uh, is, is, is done by the air spring. That is, you provide the air pressure, additional air pressure on one side of the air spring and the train is tilted. This is used mainly in Japan and in China also. Then there is a hydraulic tilting where the hydraulic uh, do, with the hydraulic uh, pressure you tilt the train and there is a pendulino uh, train which has got a, sp a specific design of bogey and the frame of the train uh, where the like a pendulum this uh, train is tilted uh, and uh, which is running in italy uh, and um, and in some of the countries then there is a natural tilting train on the extreme right, uh, which is called the Talgo trains, where the car body is basically hang, it is, is supported from the top, and there there is there is there are two pairs of wheel. Uh, there are, there is no axle. These two wheels are is, is supported by a special bogey type of arrangement, and here the since the car body is supported from the top, it it has got natural tilting when on the curves and you can achieve a higher speed on the curve. So advantage of the tilting system is that you can achieve higher speed on the sharper curves. And by doing that, you can save the travel time by around 10 to 15%. The disadvantage of tilting train as per some of the paper is because since you are, I mean, you are unnaturally tilting the train on the inside of the curve, there is, there is a possibility of motion sickness to the passengers. And since you are tilting on the inside, on the inner side of the wheel, there will be additional pressure uh, on, on, the, on this wheel. So there will be an excess wear and tear on the wheel as well as on the track. So it cost, uh, there is additional cost of the maintenance. And since you are tilting the train uh, at a higher speed, and uh, if the wind is more than 83 kmph, then there is a possibility of overturning also. So you have to keep monitoring the wind speed also accordingly and you have to restrict the speed of the train on the curves in case the uh, wind speed increases beyond a limit. Then we come to very important feature uh, of the high speed train is, is, the, is the 
air tightness of the car body uh, and all high speed trains which are running uh, all over the world where there is a tunnel uh, you require air tightness in the body uh, of the car body because if the car body is not airtight uh, passengers may feel pain in their ear when the train enters in the tunnel why it happens uh, because when the train enters at a higher speed in a tunnel the external pressure uh, outside the car body is it fluctuates uh, in this manner uh, we see the blue blue curve so this is a typical curve of a uh, of a pressure fluctuation outside the car body outside the train when the two trains passes uh, each other uh, at high speed in a tunnel so as you can see there is a huge fluctuation uh, in the in the outside pressure and if the car body is not made airtight the same fluctuation will happen inside the train and this sharp decrease and increase in the air pressure inside the train will cause uh, ear pain in the passengers so they are the car body is made airtight so that external air pressure changes do not affect the internal pressure changes and if you can see the for a good air good inside good airtight uh, train the inside fluctuation uh, inside air pressure fluctuation will be quite smoother quite low as compared to the external uh, external air pressure uh, to the to the train and so by uh, maintaining the air tightness of the train uh, the internal pressure fluctuations are reduced where the passengers do not feel any ear pain we will see the standards for the for this comfort criteria for the sealed trains i mean uh, when you say the car is 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 sealed one or the air tight one the leakage rate of the air uh, should be defined so there are various standards which are available worldwide which is followed that is uic 660 uic 779 then there are country specific um, specific uh, standards also and if you can see Uh, the leakage rate, uh, which is normally described for these uh, these criteria, and you can see the UIC 660 says it is 0.5 kilo kilo pascal um, should be the leakage in one second, uh, whereas in Japan it is 0.4 is the lowest. There is the the criteria in Japan is the most stringent, and there is a UIC 779 also which says one one kilo pascal in one second. Uh, the Netherlands is 0.85, and you can see it is prescribed for the three seconds also, four second also, and ten second also. So depending upon the which standard one is following, uh, these these pressure leakage, uh, this air leakage is is defined. But if you see the Japanese and and the Italians, they prescribe for the unlimited period also. That means, for I mean the the total leakage should not happen more than one kilo pascal. regardless of the time so i mean from the initial pressure to the to the final pressure there is only 1 kilo pascal is allowed and in italy it is 1.5 kilo pascal so now we will see how how what is actual values of of these leakage rates which are achieved in different trains and if you see the bombardier trains which are made for china which is running at 330 kmph uh, has got a leakage rate of around 200 pascal in one second that is around 0.2 kilo pascal well below the criteria any any of the criteria and the chinese trains they are in around the range of 181 to 246 uh, pascal uh, per second alstom uh, uh, says less than 500 for snc of siemens is around 200 But the Shinkansen, if you see the Shinkansen trains, uh, they permit only 120 pascal in one second. That means the, the ceiling of the, the Shinkansen train is is very good. And besides the ceiling, they also uh, do a little bit of pressurization in the uh, in, in the uh, passenger cabin uh, to the range of around 0.4 to 0.5 kPa. They maintain a, a positive pressure inside the uh, inside the passenger area. so that also adds to the uh, uh, it's it's improves the air tightness of the train how uh, this uh, car body is made uh, air tight this is is important to know and uh, any high speed train is manufactured with the, with a long double skin hollow aluminum alloy extrusions 
which has got a truss cross section. So this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, hollow skin uh, extrusion uh, it also acts uh, as a noise uh, barrier as well as it improves the air tightness because the welding of aluminium alloy is is easier. It is it is done by using big and uh, friction stir welding. The complete car body is made airtight, obviously, uh, for for out to avoid discomfort. And uh, the cavity between uh, between the two uh, between the extrusions between the two walls uh, is filled with the fiber wool, which also acts as a sound absorb absorbent and continuous welding using MIG or FSW and providing sealants uh, on the gaps. Uh, makes the car body uh, quite airtight uh, in case of high speed trains. Now comes the passenger comfort. This is a very important criteria for designing any high speed rolling stock. And uh, because at higher speed, uh, there will be vibrations in the lateral, longitudinal, and vertical directions. So, uh, different standards are there for uh, uh, describing the right comfort of the high speed trains uh, one is iso or en or japanese so what they do is uh, as per these standards uh, they measure the vertical and lateral acceleration uh, not the longitudinal uh, accelerations and and basically it is a weighted vibration acceleration acceleration which is measured uh, and in case of Japan, uh, they measure it is in, in, in a logarithm, logarithm form that is in dB. And if you see the standards uh, which is followed uh, in Japan or uh, in, uh, in European countries where they follow ISO and EN, uh, the parameters are given here. I mean, for a very comfortable ride comfort, the acceleration has to be less than 0.2 meter per second square. Whereas in Japan, uh, for a very comfortable cat group uh, or the uh, category, uh, the acceleration is around 0.14 meter per second square. And for the comfortable zone also in Japan, you can see uh, the accelerations are quite less in vertical and lateral directions. In China, uh, they follow the Sperling index uh, method uh, where uh, uh, the peak acceleration amplitude, its corresponding frequency, and the frequency weighted function uh, is is measured and put in this formula um, uh, to find out a factor uh, which is called W. And if it is less than 2.5, it is excellent uh, ride comfort. And if it is between 2.5 to 2.75, it is all right or comfortable. Normally, trains are designed for either comfortable or very comfortable quality. Uh, in EN uh, one uh, one double two double nine, uh, there is a, a nominal mean value also for the uh, for the vibrations where where the acceleration in all three directions are measured, and it is now very prevalent in in Europe and uh, all the countries and all the manufacturers are adopting this parameter uh, for the ride comfort, uh, where they took. They take 60 samples of readings of uh, these acceleration in all three directions, and 90, 95th percentile, that is most 57th worst reading, is taken, and uh, they are uh, squared and uh, square root is taken, and uh, then NMV is calculated as per this formula, and the NMV value is less than 1.5. Uh, it is categorized as very comfortable, and it is between 1.5 to 2.5, it is comfortable. Noise. Noise is also very important uh, and the most uh, environmental point of view is the most important factor for a high speed train because when the train moves at high speed, it produces a lot of noise. The source of noise, as you can see in this picture, uh, is, is from the aerodynamic sound from the upper or from the nose of the train. Then there is, there is aerodynamic noise from the side between the cars. There are sound from the lower part of the uh, trains, which is basically rolling parts, and there are sound from the uh, structure. If it is a wire duct, there is a, some sound from the wire duct because it vibrates. And one of the power sources uh, is the It also produces uh, a very significant noise at a high speed. 
so we will see how these um, these parts of the rolling stock due to the overall noise uh, there was a trial run in japan for a 275 kmph train and at a 360 kmph train as you can see uh, in a 275 kmph train you can see all the elements of noise for example you can see this is a aerodynamic noise from the upper part of the body this is a structural noise there is a pantograph noise and there is a aerodynamic noise from the train nose and as you can see the pantograph noise is is, is is quite significant and if you add all these noise the overall noise is this one for 275 kmph uh, so so for up to 275 kmph you can see the pantograph noise and and the noise from the lower part of the cars uh, are basically dominating they are i mean in the region they are more or less same but as you increase the trade uh, beyond 275 kmph you can see the pantograph noise dominates very clearly i mean at higher speed the pantograph produces much more noise which is which has to be controlled uh, and overall noise obviously will increase because of that so pantograph is a very important element uh, for curbing the noise at high speed so how the noise mitigation is done uh, as you have seen the various sources of noise in, in the running high speed train so so uh, to in to uh, produce the noise coming out from the lower part of the train that is rolling parts of the train you provide the side covers uh, which uh, which uh, avoids uh, the, which reflects the sound uh, waves um, and do not allow the sound waves to come out from the lower part of the body similarly uh, uh, for the aerodynamic noise uh, uh, in between the trains you provide the fairings so that there is a smooth uh, a smoothness on the car body on the side of the car body which reduces the noise the pantograph is specifically designed uh, as a low noise pantograph with single arm and so many features uh, that reduces noise itself if you can see the base is also aerodynamically designed and besides that you have got a noise insulation panel on both sides of the pantographs pantographs uh, which basically avoids the noise to come out of the uh, of the train now the various ways of measuring these noise and standards uh, how how these noise is measured and how what are the standards which are followed um, uh, worldwide so when the train passes this is a typical graph of the noise which is produced when the train is is, is passed and there are two ways of measuring it one is uh, the, that is you measure the equivalent continuous sound uh, in terms of db uh, where basically you average out the total noise produced while the train uh, is is passed for the pass by time you basically average out the uh, the noise and this is basically followed in the european unions this is as per technical specification of interoperability in in european unions whereas in japan it is a peak value for a pass by time the peak value is considered in japan and when we see the standards uh, regulations in japan they allow 70 db for uh, category one of area which is a basically residential area and 75 db of the peak noise for a non non residential area which is commercial or industrial area so for a for a pass by noise the peak noise will always be more than the average value of the noise so the the japanese way of measuring is is is, is, is stringent and what they do they measure 20 uh, noise of the 20 peak values of the 20 successive trains and they uh, take the measurement at 25 meter from the track center at and at the height of 1.2 meter and the out of 20 that they that uh, the 10 worst reading um, they take the average of these uh, these all 10 readings and then they compare with the standard whereas in uh, in europe uh, as per the technical specification of interoperability it specifies uh, noise at 250 kmph as 95 db so if you see that in japan it was 70 71 db whereas in in europe it is 95 db that is the average value not the peak value 
and it is measured at 25 meter at um, at 3.5 meter uh, above the height uh, above, the, above, the, above the ground and for for the train um, above 250 kmp this value has to be um, suitably extrapolated there is another uh, regulation that is uic 660 which is mostly followed in europe uh, also which specifies uh, the pass by noise at 300 kmp is 91 uh, it is stricter than the e the tsi and it is measured at 25 meter from the center of the track and 3.5 meters above the rail line so these are the various standards uh, and regulations which are followed worldwide uh, in japan and in europe uh, then i come to the last topic of my presentation which is very important that is aerodynamic requirement why do we require uh, aerodynamic shape of the train nose of a high speed train uh, going fast means pushing air out of the way and which requires a lot of power so if you don't uh, design your train aerodynamically you require a lot of power to move a train and uh, with the speed this power increases uh, very drastically uh, for a 300 kmps train as compared to 100 kmps train the power requirement will be around 27 times because the power requirement is is is, is basically cube of the speed and besides this the ground level air is denser so you require a more power to displace the air uh, at the ground level the aerodynamic design of the train becomes of paramount importance for a high-speed train uh, if you see why why when we say why the aerodynamic design is so important uh, and uh, that is also I mean, can be proven by uh, this resistance curve. If you see the the, the resistance um, curve of any train, it looks like this, and the formula which governs the um, uh, this high resistance of the train is A plus B B plus C B square. That means there is a there is a constant which is independent of the velocity. There is a constant which is proportional to the velocity, and there is a constant which is proportional to the square of the velocity. And if you can see the C C, if you see the uh, the constant C is basically uh, the resistance coming from the headwind pressure, the side skin effect, and between the car bodies. That means it is all the aerodynamic design which comes into play, uh, which which uh, is dependent upon the square of the speed. So the better your uh, your head of the train, that is nose, uh, is, is the, it, it is aerodynamically designed. This constant will be reduced and uh, the requirement of uh, the dependency on the v square will reduce where a and b are different uh, parameters will depend upon the a is which is independent of uh, speed is basically rail fill, rail wheel resistance bearing resistance and b uh, which is directly proportional to the speed it has got a rail wheel resistance some part of the rail wheel resistance is proportional to to the speed also and the flange resistance so so the aerodynamic design is is very important to reduce the drag besides the drag reduction there is another important uh, phenomena happens uh, when that uh, the high speed train enters in the into the tunnel uh, when the it enters into the tunnel there is a lot of disturbance takes place uh, inside the tunnel and the micro pressure waves are generated inside the train and when the train leaves uh, the tunnel these micro pressure waves when they expand, they uh, they uh, produce a blasting sound, sound, and um, a, a very high level of sound is produced. So, so if you don't uh, design your head of the train, nose of the train, scientifically, there is a possibility that you have got a lot of micropressure waves generated, and a lot of blasting sound is is generated. So, to reduce these uh, these micropressure waves and blasting sound, uh, this nose is very scientifically designed uh, for aer aerodynamic shape so there are various ways of uh, reducing the aerodynamic uh, drag and this also reduces the aerodynamic noise also as we have seen earlier also that is that you provide fairings between the between the two cars so that they are smooth there is no gap uh, uh, in uh, between the two cars and which reduces the air drag also and the sound also sound produced by the uh, aerodynamic then uh, small small things like the grab handle for the driver there is a 
this, they are provided in a slot and uh, at a higher speed this slot may produce uh, uh, air drag so at higher speed there is a covering which is closed at higher speed so that the surface becomes smooth the side skin drag um, is reduced in that way uh, um, and this will also reduce the aerodynamic noise from the train and uh, the side bottom covers, uh, I mean, these, these bottom covers which are provided in the bogey area as well as non-bogey areas, they also reduce the side drag of the train. How do we uh, define these, uh, these aerodynamic uh, requirements? Um, there are, uh, uh, to define it and uh, to understand the standards for this, we need to understand the phenomena of, uh, of the aerodynamic uh, head pressure. Pulses. That means when the train moves at a higher speed, it produces at a, a semi-spherical high pressure zone at the head of the train and at the tail of the train. And if the pressure is measured in this in this in semi-spherical zone, there is a positive peak which is and this is followed by a negative peak. And in between the train, there will be small pressure changes because of the of the these joints that means between the car bodies the side of the car body and between the cars and the, in the tail there will be a negative peak and then the positive peak obviously the negative in the positive peak of uh, of the tail is 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 lower than the uh, than the head peak so this is uh, this this is the type of pressure pulse uh, is is felt uh, around the train uh, when the high speed train passes and this affects the side structures so these have to be measured for a high speed trains and this has to be within the limits and if you and if you see the scientifically the formula of these pressure peak uh, you can see it the pressure peak is proportional to the aerodynamic shape of the train the kt is basically the the shape uh, train shape factor and it depends upon the speed the square of the speed so the the better the uh, train aerodynamic shape, the lower this factor and the lower will be the pressure pulse. Why it has to be lower? The pressure pulse has to be lower because it affects the side structures and uh, when uh, uh, when the train passes, uh, the side structures are subjected to repeated these pulse pressures and there are fatigue which can uh, come, which can set, can set in the structures. So there is a standard for that. Uh, the technical specification of interoperability defines that what should be the value of head pressure pulse for a high speed train uh, up to a 250 kmph or more. It defines that that uh, the head pressure pulse should be measured at, at a distance of 2.5 meter from the track center. And at the height of 1.5 to 3 meter, the, the value of the pressure pulse should be less than 800 Pascal. So all high-speed trains uh, has to follow this uh, this criteria, and that is why it is it is important that uh, the, uh, the the top of the train or the nose of the train is is very scientifically designed uh, in aerodynamic shape to reduce these pulses. Besides this, air pressure pulses uh, there is a stream effect. That is, a lot of air is displaced um, near the uh, near the uh, speed trains when it passes. So it affects the passengers on the platform if the train is passing through the platform or if there are some workers they are working uh, near the track. So there has to be some limit of uh, this slip stream effect also of the wind speed which is displayed. And as, as you can see, uh, the air speed which is, uh, which is produced, the air which, which is disturbed uh, is um, the speed of that air is also depending upon the aerodynamic shape of the of the train and uh, uh, as per this uh, uh, technical specification of interoperability uh, i mean this wind pressure wind wind speed is also uh, defined that means at 3 meter from the track center and at a height of 0.2 meter from the top of the rail the wind speed has to be lesser than 22.5 meter and at 1.4 meter from the top of the rail it has to be less than 18 meter per second similarly for more than 250 kmph also, the, there are parameters which have to be met uh, by high-speed trains and, uh, and it is achieved by designing the shape of the train uh, in the aerodynamic uh, way. 
So uh, the shape of the train, I mean, the shape of the nose is 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 very important as we have seen uh, in the last few slides. And for manufacturing these nose, a special effort goes in. And for Shinkansen train, there is a small video which shows that how what effort and complete nose majority of the nose of the train is is manually uh, manufactured it is manually uh, carved so this video will show what effort goes into manufacturing of a shinkansen high speed train nose so let us have a look uh, at this uh, uh, at this video The Shinkansen bullet trains, fastest the world over. The bullet train service began 35 years ago. Since then, the trains have become faster and more diversified. Ten models are now in production. The aerodynamic shape of the locomotive nose is necessary to achieve a smooth and quiet ride, even at 300 kilometers an hour. A craftsman's skills are not easily replaced by machines. The human touch is still required to create the complex curved designs of the nose section. Jiro Kunimura started his trade at 17. He's been involved in bullet train production from the very first model. He now works on about 10 trains each year and has completed a total of 200 so far. The surface at the front of the driver's cab is divided into small sections. Shinkansen require between 60 and 100 sections. Today's bullet noses are made of aluminum sheets, 2.5 to 6 millimeters thick. Using only his hammer, Jiro creates the front and rear sections for the train. He senses the state of the aluminum through the difference in sounds and vibrations that his arms feel when he hammers the metal. He patiently shapes the aluminum sheets to make them expand, bend or twist. A perfect shape is vital to ensure a safe and smooth ride for the train. Two hours later a new plate is complete. High-speed airflow around the nose of the train can cause the aluminum sections to vibrate and separate. To ensure passenger safety, craftsmen must make sure that all parts fit together perfectly. It takes Jiro Kunimura some 20 days to complete one job. It takes three years to learn how to wield a hammer accurately. It takes at least 10 years of training to learn how to create any and every kind of curve. Half a dozen young craftsmen are refining their skills under Master Kunimura's watchful eye. The craftsman's hammer brings to life the unique shape of Japan's high-speed trains. safety record of the Shinkansen trains can be partly attributed to the careful craftsmanship of dedicated workers like Jiro Kunimura. So that ends my presentation. Thank you very much.